my life wasn't always a roller coaster. There was a time when everything seemed perfectly aligned, like stars in a clear night sky. That was until the storm hit, and boy, did it hit hard. Let me take you back to where it all started. My name's Ava, just a regular gal who landed a job at a prestigious family-owned company. That's where I met Jack, my future storm, though back then, he was just a handsome guy with a killer smile working the same grind as me. Hey, Ava, right? I've seen you around. Jack. Jack Harrison. He introduced himself one day at the office, extending a hand that felt like it was molded just for mine. Yeah, that's me. Nice to meet you, Jack. I replied, feeling a spark I hadn't felt before. Our office romance blossomed faster than a wildfire, and before I knew it, we were tying the knot. It was a beautiful ceremony, the kind you see in movies, but little did I know, it was the calm before the storm. Jack's family, especially his mom, Mrs. Harrison, and his dad, the big boss of the company, had their own ideas about what my role in the family should be. Ava, dear, you know it's best if you focus on the home. Let Jack handle the business, Mrs. Harrison would often say, her words coated with a sweetness that couldn't mask the bitterness I felt being sidelined. But I have a degree and experience. I can contribute to the company. I tried to argue once, only to be met with a patronizing chuckle from Mr. Harrison. Darling, we appreciate your enthusiasm, but let's leave the business to those who know it, he said, dismissing me as if I were a child. Jack didn't stand up for me. Instead, he echoed his family's sentiments. Babe, it's for the best. You'll see. We can start a family, and you'll have all the time to take care of our home, he said, wrapping his arm around me, trying to sell me a future I never asked for. I eventually gave in, quitting my job to become the housewife they all wanted me to be. But satisfaction was far from what I found. Each day felt like I was losing a piece of myself, my identity drowned out by the endless cycle of household chores and Jack's increasing demands. I tried to reach out to Jack, to tell him how isolated and belittled I felt. Jack, this isn't what I signed up for. I'm more than just a cook or a cleaner. I pleaded one night, hoping to find the man I fell in love with. Ava, you're being dramatic. This is what women do, they take care of their homes. And honestly, you could put a bit more effort into it and yourself, he shot back, his words like daggers to my heart. That conversation was the first of many storms to come, each one eroding the love and respect I had for Jack. I started to see the man he truly was, not the one I married but someone who saw me as nothing more than a convenience, an accessory to his life of privilege and entitlement. Life after marriage and Ethan's birth was supposed to be the dream, but instead, it felt like I was walking on eggshells, constantly trying to dodge the next criticism or sarcastic remark. The warmth in our home had turned cold, and the cracks in my marriage to Jack began to show, deep and jagged. One evening, as I set the dinner table, hoping to bring some semblance of normalcy back into our home, Jack walked in, his face twisted in displeasure the moment he saw the spread. What's this? He asked, poking at the food with a fork as if it might bite back. It's your favorite, lasagna. I tried a new recipe, thought it might be a nice change. I said, my voice barely above a whisper, bracing myself for his reaction. Jack took a bite, chewed for a moment, and then pushed the plate away, his face contorted in disgust. This is your idea of a nice change? It tastes like cardboard. Can't you do anything right? His words felt like a slap across the face. I fought back tears, not wanting to give him the satisfaction of seeing me crumble. I'm sorry you didn't like it. I'll try something else tomorrow. I replied, my voice steady, but my heart breaking. Don't bother. I'll just order from the restaurant. At least they know how to cook. He retorted, grabbing his phone to dial. That night, as I cleaned up the untouched plates of food, Mrs. Harrison made her grand entrance, as if on cue, ready to add salt to the wound. Ava, dear, I heard about your little cooking mishap. Let me show you how it's done. Not that you'll ever learn, she said, her tone patronizing, her eyes scanning the kitchen with undisguised contempt. 
I wanted to scream, to tell her to get out of my kitchen, my home, but I held my tongue. Arguing with her was like talking to a brick wall, only more frustrating. As she took over the stove, demonstrating how to make the perfect lasagna, I couldn't help but think back to the days when Jack and I would cook together, laughing and sharing stories. Those days felt like a distant memory now, replaced by criticism and cold shoulders. Jack's disdain for my cooking was just one of the many issues. He started commenting on my appearance, making snide remarks about the weight I hadn't lost since Ethan's birth, about how I didn't dress up anymore or bother with makeup. Ava, look at yourself. You've let yourself go. Is it any wonder I prefer eating out? He'd say, his words dripping with disdain. I'm taking care of Ethan, the house, everything. When do you expect me to find the time to go to the gym or get dolled up? It's not like you're helping. I shot back one day, my patience wearing thin. Jack just laughed, a harsh, mocking sound that echoed in the empty spaces of our home. Excuses, Ava. You're just lazy. And you wonder why I'm out more often? Maybe if you put in some effort, I'd want to spend time at home. His words stung, a reminder of how far we drifted apart. The man I married, who used to look at me like I was the only woman in the world, now looked through me, as if I were nothing more than a nuisance. The cracks in our marriage weren't just showing, they were widening, threatening to swallow me whole. I felt trapped, caught in a cycle of trying to please a man who no longer saw my worth, and battling a mother-in-law who relished in my failures. Life as a full-time housewife was a tough gig, more so when your input was constantly belittled. I remember this one evening vividly, a turning point of sorts. It was during one of those rare moments I thought I could bridge my old life with my new one. We were sitting around the dinner table, the Harrison men, discussing the company's latest venture. I saw an opening, a chance to remind them, and maybe myself, that I wasn't just background noise. You know, if you tweaked your marketing strategy to target a younger demographic, you could increase your market share significantly. I chimed in, my voice steady, but my heart racing. Jack and his dad, mid-bite, exchanged looks that screamed, is she for real? Mr. Harrison, after a dramatic pause, let out a laugh that echoed off the walls. Ava, sweetheart, stick to what you know. This is business, not some home project. Yeah, babe, let the men handle the big stuff, Jack added, his tone laced with a condescension that made my blood boil. I pushed back, feeling my old fire flickering. Actually, I have a degree in finance. Remember? I might know a thing or two that could help. But Jack waved me off. Finance, schminance. It's cute you want to help, but let's not pretend you're a player in this game. The conversation moved on, but I sat there, stewing in a mix of anger and humiliation. It was clear I was no longer seen as an equal, if I ever was. Later that night, I called my dad, needing to vent to someone who saw me as more than just a sideline spouse. Dad, I'm so tired of being dismissed. I tried to offer advice tonight, and Jack and his dad laughed in my face, I said, the frustration evident in my voice. Sweetheart, I've told you about them. They're all high and mighty, because of that company. But you, you're smart, and you're strong. You don't need their validation. My dad's voice was calm, but I could hear the anger simmering beneath. He then dropped a bombshell. You know what? Let's give them a taste of their own medicine. I've got some money saved up from my investments. How about we buy a significant stake in their precious company? I laughed, the idea sounding absurd and thrilling all at once. Dad, you're joking, right? We can't just buy into the company. Why not? It's public, isn't it? Let's shake things up a bit. Show them you're not just some trophy wife, he said, the mischief in his voice infectious. The idea was tempting, a way to reclaim some of the respect I'd lost, not just from them, but from myself. But it also felt like stepping into a battlefield I wasn't sure I was ready for. I'll think about it, Dad. It's just, it's a lot, I said, the weight of the decision heavy on my shoulders. The day everything changed wasn't marked by any particular event. 
It was just a regular morning, but for me, it was the beginning of the end, and a new beginning. I had been feeling off for weeks, tired beyond the usual exhaustion that came with managing a home and taking care of Ethan, our son. Jack noticed too, but his concern felt more obligatory than genuine. Ava, you look like hell. What's wrong with you? He asked one morning, his tone more annoyed than concerned. I don't know, Jack. I'm just tired. Really tired. I replied, trying to muster a smile, but even that felt like too much effort. Maybe you should see a doctor. I can't have you being lazy around the house, he said, his words cutting deeper than he probably intended. So, I went to the doctor, expecting to be told I needed more vitamins or rest. But what I got instead was a diagnosis that turned my world upside down, breast cancer. I remember sitting there, in that sterile office, feeling like I was outside my body, watching as the doctor's mouth moved, words coming out that didn't make sense cancer? Me? When I told Jack, his reaction was far from what I'd hoped for. Cancer? Are you serious? How did this happen? He said, more in anger than worry. How does this happen to anyone, Jack? I don't know. But I need treatment. Surgery, maybe more, I said, the weight of my own words sinking in. And what about Ethan? And the house? Who's going to take care of everything? he asked, his priorities laying bare the gap between us. I felt a loneliness then that was unlike anything I'd ever experienced. This was my partner, the man I'd chosen to build a life with, and in my moment of greatest need, he was worried about who would take care of the house. The following weeks were a blur of appointments and treatments. I grew weaker, physically and emotionally, and Jack. Jack grew distant. The few times I tried to talk to him about my fears, my hopes, he brushed me off. And then a terrible thing happened. The doctor, with a solemn look that prefaced bad news, told me that the best course of action was a mastectomy. Breast removal surgery. The words echoed in my head, a relentless echo that refused to fade. I was reeling from the news, but I knew I had to tell Jack. His reaction, however, was something I could never have prepared for. When I told him about the surgery, I searched his face for any sign of support or compassion. Instead, I was met with a look that I can only describe as disgust. It was a fleeting moment, but it was there, unmistakable and cutting deep. He didn't say anything, just turned and walked away, leaving me alone with my fears and the growing realization of how alone I truly was. The day of the surgery arrived, and with it, a profound sense of isolation. Lying in the hospital bed, I faced not only the physical pain of my ordeal, but the acute awareness that Jack, the man who had promised to be by my side in sickness and in health, was conspicuously absent. My parents were there, their faces etched with worry and love, but the space where Jack should have been was glaringly empty. Not once did he come to the hospital. Not a single visit from him or even my father-in-law. It was as if, in their eyes, my illness had rendered me invisible, unworthy of their time or concern. I lay there, post-surgery, grappling with the pain and the betrayal, feeling more alone than ever. Coming back from the hospital felt like stepping into an alternate reality. I stood at the doorstep of what used to be my home, my heart pounding, not from the pain of surgery, but from the uncertainty of what awaited me. The door swung open, and there he was, Jack, but he wasn't alone. Beside him stood a young woman, her presence like a slap in the face. Before I could process the scene before me, Jack's words cut through the air, cold and sharp. Here are your things, he said, gesturing to a couple of suitcases on the porch. And these, he handed me a stack of papers, are divorce papers. I want you out, Ava. I stared at him, disbelief and pain warring within me. Jack, what are you saying? This is my home, our home. He scoffed, a cruel edge to his voice. Not anymore. I don't need a woman without breasts. I've moved on. She's everything you're not, he said, his arm wrapping around the waist of the woman beside him. The words were a physical blow, leaving me reeling. I felt a surge of anger but it was quickly drowned out by a profound sense of betrayal. 
Without another word, I grabbed my things and left, the finality of the moment weighing heavily on me. I went to my in-laws next, hoping for some semblance of support, or at the very least, to see my son. The reception I received was as cold as the one I had just left. My mother-in-law's eyes raked over me with undisguised contempt. When Ethan was brought to me, his face lit up, a stark contrast to the tension around us. Mommy, he exclaimed, throwing his arms around me. The warmth of his embrace was a small comfort in the sea of coldness. My father-in-law didn't waste time with pleasantries. Take your son and leave, he said, his voice devoid of any warmth. And don't even think about claiming any part of our property. You'll get nothing. As I stood there, trying to muster the strength to leave, my mother-in-law's voice stopped me. You're nothing but an inferior woman now, she said, her words laced with venom. No wonder he doesn't want you. The words stung, but they also fueled a fire within me. With Ethan, by my side, I left, knowing that this was not the end for us. It was a bitter farewell to a life that had become a prison. Back at my parents' house, with Ethan playing quietly in the corner of the room, I sat down with my dad, the weight of the world on my shoulders. The air was thick with tension, but also an unspoken understanding. My dad was the first to break the silence. Ava, remember what we talked about before? About the company shares, he said, his voice steady, his gaze meeting mine. I let out a humorless laugh, the absurdity of the situation not lost on me. Dad, I thought you were joking. After everything, it feels like. I don't know, like grasping at straws. He leaned forward, his expression serious. I wasn't joking, Ava. I did it. I bought a significant stake in the Harrison Company. I blinked, the words taking a moment to register. You what? Dad, do you know what this means? He nodded, a sly smile, playing on his lips. Yes, it means you have leverage, Ava. It means you can fight back. The idea was ludicrous, yet incredibly tempting. It was a chance to regain some control, to not be the victim in this narrative any longer. But how? Jack and his family have made it clear they want nothing to do with me. I countered, the doubt evident in my voice. That may be true, but now you're not just Ava, the cast-aside wife. You're Ava, the shareholder. You have a say in how things are run, maybe even get a seat on the board, he said, the possibility hanging in the air like a promise. The conversation shifted then, to logistics, to legalities, to strategies. For the first time in a long time I felt a spark of hope, a flicker of excitement at the prospect of turning the tables. But what about Ethan? And mom? I asked, my resolve firming, but my concern for my family paramount. We're in this together, Ava. Your mom and I, we've got your back. And Ethan, he's going to see his mom standing up for herself. That's important, Dad said, his voice filled with conviction. It was a plan born out of desperation, but it was a plan nonetheless. As the night grew deeper, and Ethan fell asleep on the couch, I realized this was more than just about revenge or retribution. It was about reclaiming my life, my dignity, and showing my son the strength of standing up for oneself. Dad, let's do this. Let's shake things up, I said, a determined resolve settling over me. He nodded, a proud smile on his face. That's my girl. As I tucked Ethan into bed that night, the uncertainty of the future loomed large. Yet, beneath it all was a burgeoning sense of empowerment. For the first time in a long while, I looked forward to what the next day would bring, ready to face the challenges head-on. This unexpected twist was not just a lifeline, it was a call to arms. And I was ready to answer it. Walking into the annual meeting, I felt like I was stepping into a lion's den. There they were, Jack and his dad, looking all confident and in charge. Their faces dropped when they saw me, though. What are you doing here, Ava? Jack asked, his voice dripping with disbelief. I didn't miss a beat. Pulling out the documents, I laid them on the table with a thud. I own 90% of the company now. That means I'm not just here to sit pretty, I'm here to call the shots. 
you could have heard a pin drop. Jack and his dad exchanged looks, their faces going from confused to downright angry. This is ridiculous. You can't just barge in here and take over. Jack's dad blustered, standing up from his chair. I shot him a look, my patience wearing thin. Sit down, or I'll have security help you do it. This is happening, whether you like it or not. I then laid out my plan, clear and straightforward. We're going to shift the company's direction. I have a plan that will double our profits. It's time for a change, and I'm leading it. The room was silent as I spoke, everyone processing the bomb I'd just dropped. You could see the wheels turning in their heads, calculating the possibilities. Jack tried to argue, his pride wounded. You think you can just waltz in and run the show? This is my family's company. I met his gaze, steady and unflinching. It was your family's company. Now, it's mine. And I'm not just waltzing in, I've got a plan, and the board agrees. The decision was made. The board, seeing the potential in my plan, backed me up. It was a surreal moment, watching Jack and his father realize the tables had turned. As the meeting ended, and the room cleared, Jack approached me, his demeanor changed. Ava, let's talk about this. There's got to be a way we can work together. But it was too late for negotiations or pleasantries. We're past talking, Jack. It's time for action. And as for working together, that ship has sailed. It's time for a new era, and I'm at the helm. After the dust settled from the shareholders' meeting, I took the helm of the company with a mix of determination and anticipation. The first few weeks were a whirlwind of meetings, planning sessions, and getting up to speed on every aspect of the business. I was determined to turn the company around, not just for the sake of profits, but to prove to myself and everyone else that I could do this. One afternoon, as I was poring over some reports, Ethan burst into my office, his eyes wide with excitement. Mom, you're like a superhero now. You own a whole company. I couldn't help but laugh, pulling him into a hug. Well, I don't know about superhero, but I'm definitely trying to make some big changes. He looked up at me, his expression turning serious. Does this mean you're gonna be too busy for me now? The question hit me harder than any boardroom challenge. I knelt down to his level, holding his hands in mine. Ethan, there's nothing more important to me than you. We're a team, remember? I might have more work, but we'll always make time for each other. He smiled, his earlier worry replaced by a gleam of pride. Okay, mom. I believe you. Can I help with the company too? Sure, you can be my special advisor. How does that sound? I teased, ruffling his hair. Awesome, he exclaimed, already brimming with ideas. The next challenge came from within the company itself. Some of the longtime employees were resistant to change, skeptical of my leadership. I called a staff meeting, determined to address their concerns head on. I know there are doubts, and I understand why. I started, scanning the room. But I promise you, every decision I make is with the future of this company in mind. We have an incredible opportunity to grow, to innovate, and I want all of you to be a part of that. There was silence for a moment before one of the senior managers spoke up. We've seen what you're proposing, Ava. It's ambitious, but if anyone can lead us there, I believe it's you. Nods and murmurs of agreement filled the room, a tangible shift in the atmosphere. It was the beginning of a new era for the company, and for me. As months turned into a year, the company's fortunes began to change. We were making strides, hitting targets that once seemed out of reach. And with each success, my confidence grew, not just in my professional abilities, but in my personal resilience. Jack reached out a few times, hints of regret in his messages, but I knew that some bridges were meant to burn. I was building a new life, one that was defined by my own terms, my own successes and failures. Sitting in my office one evening, looking out at the city lights, I reflected on the journey. From feeling lost and diminished to standing strong, leading a company, and raising an incredible son. It hadn't been easy, 
but I had emerged on the other side, not just intact, but stronger, wiser, and more determined than ever. Ethan, time to go home. I called out, closing my laptop. He ran into the room, his latest drawing in hand, a colorful depiction of us together, standing tall. This is us, Mom. We're a team, he said, his eyes shining. Yes, we are, I replied, holding his drawing close. And we always will be. As we walked out of the office together, I knew that whatever the future held, I was ready. I had rebuilt my life on my terms, and no matter what came next, I had the strength to face it.